The truth has always been in plain sight. If I gave you a pen worth a million pound, where would you hide it? And I can see why you're thinking it. You're going to hide um, something in with other things that are very similar to kind of like bring down how special it is against other things that are uh, worthless. And you're going in the right direction. But really where you need to hide a million pound pen is just chuck it on the desk and wherever it falls is where you leave it. And the reason why you leave it there is because the first thing I want to teach you tonight, if you didn't already know this, is that things are hidden in plain sight. They got you like a pin on the desk, not knowing your true value. Who are you? You don't know. Don't tell me Negro, that's nothing. What were you before the white man named you a Negro? And where were you? And what did you have? What was yours? What language did you speak then? What was your name? It couldn't have been Smith or Jones or Bunch or Powell. That wasn't your name. They don't have those kind of names where you and I came from. No, what was your name? And why don't you now know what your name was then? Where did it go? Where did you lose it? Who took it? And how did he take it? What tongue did you speak? How did the man take your tongue? Where is your history? How did the man wipe out your history? How did the man, what did the man do to make you as dumb as you are right now? My people were assimilated and humiliated. A word to understand what that truly is, is a word created by the Greeks called Hellenization. Sometimes the only way to get you or anybody while they're still in the carnal state to understand spiritual things is analogies aka parables so we're going to actually break down how this happened from the greek enslavement the psychological warfare that they have been doing against our people it's over our imprisonment is over Rejoice, Israel! <laughs> Pardon my folly, but hope you guys understand. Let's go. People say the key to fixing the problems of Negroes is education. But I say education is not the answer. Why bother? And what do niggas do in college anyway? Oh, they go there. They party. Get drunk for four, five years and end up just as ignorant as when they came in. From the outside looking in, black Greek life might look like one big party. And most people will tell you it is. You ever seen these nigger fraternities and sororities? You ever seen these things? Silliest shit I ever seen in my life. You think Aristotle turned to Achilles and said, hey, let's create a fraternity and jump up and down barking like dogs. Why must I Hell no. White man out there getting Nobel Prizes and doing business deals in the fraternities. Niggas jumping up and down with candy canes and doing all kinds of silly shit with their hands. You literally can't make this up. You got brothers throwing up the white power sign in a Greek fraternity. <laughs> Afraid Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated, founded at Indiana University, 1911. Not setting by the honors of their fathers, but liking the glory of the Greeks best of all. My people want to be everything but what they truly are, and as a consequence, they can never be anything more than a nigga. The Anti-Defamation League officially included it in its hate on display database in 2019, and the intention behind every instance is hard to know. Some examples include white nationalist Richard Spencer and right-wing internet provocateur Milo Yiannopoulos. It's also been used by interns in the Trump White House, a writer for the fringe right website Gateway Pundit, and a Chicago Cubs fan who was later banned from Wrigley Field. 
However, it was the use by the Christchurch shooting suspect that marked a shift in the conversation. Directly to God. There are four African-American sororities and five fraternities that make up the National Panhellenic Council. Establishing classical Greek as the dominant language and culture of the Near East. It is here that the Jewish people became subjects of the Greek world. Throughout world history, we often see subject peoples of a multi-ethnic empire willingly adopt the language and customs of said empire's rulers in an attempt to improve social mobility. So many Jewish peoples began to practice the Greek culture of their suzerains. This phenomenon, known as Hellenization, was perpetuated mainly by the upper strata of Jewish society namely the wealthy priests, merchants, and aristocrats in urban Jerusalem. Beta Sigma Boulay is the oldest Greek letter organization for professional men of color. The people in the black Boulay are the people who were the overseers during slavery. These are the individuals that when Moses was out in the wilderness, they were the ones that were stopping making the golden calves. The same individuals in that same spirit, that same wicked spirit is here today. Let me just show you how this works. Uh, it's you liberals who have lifted them up, Howard. Paul, you conservatives make a mistake. You can't afford to strangle hope in people without hope. People become dangerous. No, Howard, you liberals have let them invade our society. You give them jobs, political jobs. Paul, you missed the point. It's only the smart ones we move up. <laughs> that makes it even worse. No, oh, you know, we have to move them up. If we leave a smart one in the ghetto, he might develop into a leader against us. But if we raise him up into white society, we neutralize him. He feels compelled to try to act like us. He loses his identity and... Uh, his racial anger, if he has any. He becomes alien to his brothers. They realize he sold them out and they grow to hate him. He becomes worthless to them and safe for us. But no, thank you. In fact, in his love for the creature comforts, except for his color, he's become one of us. Just as ignorant as when they came in. While we were being lynch raped, and say we thought these organizations would help fight for justice later to find out our leaders answer to the very one with the blood on their hands. This criminal justice reform, opioid crisis, public health, those are issues that affect everyone but especially impact the black community. Jail, fire, jail, nigga. You know. Jail, fire, jail. <laughs> Envy thou not the oppressor and choose none of his ways. If you hate it, then you love it, baby. No. Jail, fire, jail. Like every wicked fruit, just give it time and watch it spoil. The Greeks were gruesome in the way that they converted. Check it out. Cartoon, baby. Let your soul to the Greek gods or die. Never. I pledge my honor to the Greek gods. I pledge my honor. Get up then. You'll now be a Greek soldier. I'm... I'm honored, sir. I warn you, though. Never betray your new life or you'll lose it. Let's go over the word oath. Well, let's look it up. Oath meaning. Oath, a solemn, usually formal, calling upon God or a God. Capital G means the God of Israel. Lowercase is everything else. Whatever you serve besides the God of Israel. To witness to the truth of what one says or to witness that one sincerely intends to do what one says. Hey, this is Jared Dees from TheReligionTeacher.com. Jesus uses this word mammon a couple of different times in the Gospels. The Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke. He says, no servant can serve two masters. He will either hate one and love the other or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and 
mammon. So Jesus is making a distinction here between God and something else. And what is that something else? Mammon is a word that is often used to refer to money or material wealth. So possessions, things that we have. Um, it's what we put our trust in. What is, what is what it on there? That's a ring of my profession. You don't know nothing about that. Okay, well, can we get a close-up on that? Yeah, yeah. What, what is the profession? Yeah, which profession are we talking about? Just look at it. Is it a legal profession? Of course it's legal. It's a ring of my profession. I'm trying to read it. Okay. Uh, it's too many thousands. Ah! Yeah, that's too bright. Oh, that's too bright. Go oh, anyway. Oh, Macy, are you a Macy? Of course I am. Okay. Because you know I'm all about that cake, about that cake and chicken. I'm all about that cake, about that cake and chicken. I'm all about that cake, about that cake and chicken. I'm all about that cake, about that cake. Treacherous acts are not new. Brothers and sisters, had the audacity to do it to the most perfect being to ever walk the planet. And my brothers and sisters, a slave is no greater than their master. For those with ears to hear, listen up. After presenting himself to Caiaphas, Judas began to explain the reason for his visit. But some of the rulers of the temple wondered why this man should have been invited into the council chamber. And they were curious to know the reason for this interruption. This man is Judas Iscariot, follower of Jesus of Nazareth. He tells me that he will see to it that Jesus falls into our hands. What will you give me if I deliver him to you? What do you think is a good price to offer this man? We should offer him enough. 30 pieces of silver is the price of a slave. That is a goodly sum. Let us pay him now and bind the bargain. We will pay you 30 pieces of silver. Prepare 30 pieces of silver. This man, Jesus, has stirred up the people from Galilee to Jerusalem with his false teachings. He will do a great service by helping us to rid the nation of this false prophet. watch for an opportunity. Be careful. He has many followers and it would be dangerous if they turned against us. He must be taken in the absence of the people. Now the priests would not have to search for a way to take Jesus prisoner. The way had been brought to them. It was with great satisfaction that they watched Judas leave. Now he was a puppet in their hands and they had but to await the right moment. So the bargain was made for 30 pieces of silver. One of his own disciples was ready to betray the Son of God into the hands of his enemies. If you know history in its simplest form, the Greeks were conquered by the Romans. The Romans, when they took over, they were even more savage. Now, we have to understand that the sons of Satan live by a simple saying, Ordo ab chao, order out of chaos. Well, we have to understand how they first get everything into disorder. The natural order of God is God the Father, then the son, then the man, then the woman, then the child. But what happened 
on that day, on that day, when Eve decided to deceive, when she deceived Adam, the order was no longer. They utterly broke our man, literally, in order to get to the children, in order to conquer, in order to divide, they went through our women. That's a fact. Look at simply in the animal kingdom, when a lion conquers another pride, what does he do? What does he do? He lets the women live and kills anything with a pair of testicles. That is what you do to a people you conquer. That is what you do. And my people have been conquered. Our heritage has been taken. Let's see exactly how they did it. Brick by brick. That one would come in my uh, business partner form or come in your form. He would never come in his raw, his raw form to a person, period. You get what I'm saying? He always gonna come looking like somebody else, talking like somebody else, acting like somebody else. Because generally the unknown spreads fear. We're not trying to scare anybody or anything else. So. For most Christians, Satanism is an unknown they would prefer not to explore. Most people don't see what's going on. So let's handle this. Second Corinthians 2 and 11. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, or we are not ignorant of his devices. Okay, back to the show. I tell people like music now, what they did was they, they they flipped it on us. They made, they turned music into crack. So what crack did in the 80s was like, it made a lot of people rich, but the damage it did is far more greater. So yeah. what they doing with music now is like, hey, crack in the 80s. We are yeah. gonna fuck up their whole generations Generation, to come yeah. because we are gonna dumb them down with hair. It's gonna make them feel good now, and it's gonna make it's gonna make a few of y'all it's gonna make a few of y'all rich. A but few the majority y'all gonna be but fucked up. It's gonna fuck up your generation. Fulio, man, you a bitch, nigga. Talking about my dead homeboy, nigga. Just drop that shit, nigga. Huh? Look, nigga. I'm on the seats right now, nigga. I just dropped the load, fuck, nigga. Oh, nigga. I'm pulling up right now, fuck. Beat this little nigga right here. Yeah. Hey, what's up? You remember me, nigga? Now to our I-Team investigation, Killer Beats. Rap music videos about murders in Jacksonville fuel fire in the community. Mothers of the victims are speaking out, saying the videos and lyrics have gone too far, giving specific details about the horrific crimes. I can be investigator Corley Peel is joining us live to show us how this deadly music videos, how they are really damaging families, Corley. Well, Tarek and Stacy, many of these parents I've spoken with are still waiting for arrest or they're waiting for a trial for their son's murders. While they wait for justice, music videos from rival rap groups in Jacksonville have gained popularity across the country with songs glorifying their son's murders. The music and beat are catchy. Gaining millions of views and plays on YouTube and streaming services. Local rappers rising to fame with lyrics about murders of young men in Jacksonville. Ironically, despite the hip-hop community being the driving force behind the Stop Snitching movement, rappers tend to snitch on themselves a lot. 
In 2000, rapper Gangsta Licious reportedly assaulted record executive Johnny Guinness with a tennis racket and a bottle of Hennessy on the set of a music video. Guinness refused to cooperate with authorities, but the next day, Gangsta Delicious made an appearance on MTV's TRS. Hold on, hold on. Uh, uh, drop the beat, drop the beat. Uh, Gangsta Delicious, mine's too vicious. EM, she's all day, mmm, delicious. My whole crew up in this, no doubt we gonna win this. Smack up your moms like I smack Johnny Guinness. Three o'clock yesterday, I don't care what they say. Suckers really shouldn't play, I hit them with the Hennessy. So if you got the potential to be influential, they want you. Not because you're talent, because they could use you as a tool to push their agenda. Now, in order for them to fully put you in position, they have to make sure that you're willing to get in position. Slavery was all about creating um, visions, types, stereotypes of an entire race of people as subhuman in every way. By the 1860s, African Americans began using blackface on stage. Why on earth would a black performer put on blackface and demean him or herself? They were, look, this is the 19th century. They had limited options. They were expected to. Why? Um, because it made the audiences comfortable. You know, at one time, the black man had to grin and smile all the time. You, everything, it didn't matter what. You had to keep grinning, keep smiling. That was to show all of the white people that you were not hostile and you was a happy Negro. But they also were raping the men. Same things were happening on the plantation to demasculinize the black man. Control the slave population is uh, to rape a father in front of his sons uh, or to take the biggest, baddest black man on the plantation and do something horrible to him to completely humiliate and emasculate him so the people won't respect him anymore. And, uh, and that still happens to this day. Once you destroy the man, then the women and children are at risk. But the double-edged sword is we need the women and children to get back in line. But before they do that, we have to understand brick by brick how they did it. So let's continue. First Corinthians 10 and 14. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. Idolatry is worshiping anything outside of the most high God of Israel. And if you follow somebody who follows the devil, then the devil is your father. The polytheistic gods was deeply disturbing to many Jews who clung to their monotheist faith. This sentiment was especially strong in the poorer rural communities of Judea. Talking about the ghetto. Funky, funky, get out. Trying to survive. Trying to stay alive. An often walled area of a city in which Jews are concentrated by force and law. Do you know how to get to town? Yeah, it's back the way you came. Jean Burnett came home with almost a million other black GIs. They had fought for the country in segregated ranks. They returned hoping for equality and the American dream. For many, that dream was a new home for little money down and some of the easiest credit terms in history. I went up to the salesman, we're interested in your home, we're interested in buying one, and uh, what is the procedure? Is there an application to be filled out? So forth. So he looked at me, looked around, and he said to me, he says, listen, it's not me, but the owners of this development have not as yet decided to sell these homes to Negroes. I spoke for the white people. The white people rallied behind it, and we kicked the living hell out of the niggers, sent the outer 
town niggers to the hospital and out of the state, put back to their own hometowns where they ought to have been, and the niggers in St. Augustine got quiet and went back over to nigger town where they belong. The FHA underwriters warned that the presence of even one or two non-white families could undermine real estate values in the new suburbs. These government guidelines were widely adopted by private industry. Race had long played a role in local real estate practices. Starting in the 1930s, government officials institutionalized the national appraisal system where race was as much a factor in real estate assessment as the condition of the property. Using this scheme, federal investigators evaluated 239 cities across the country for financial risk. So that those communities that were all white, suburban and far away from minority areas, uh, they received the highest rating and that was the color green. Those communities that were all minority or in the process of changing, they got the lowest rating and the color red. They were redlined. As a consequence, most of the mortgages went to suburbanizing America and it suburbanized it racially. As homes in white communities appreciated in value, the net worth of these white families grew. For most non-white families who stayed in urban neighborhoods, the housing market open to them in the 50s and 60s was largely a rental market. You don't gain equity by paying rent. Where one's family lives in America is not just a matter of, of taste and preference. You have the issue of housing and wealth. The majority of Americans hold most of their wealth in the form of home equity. So that's their nest egg. That's how they can finance the education of their offspring. That's how they can um, sort of save up for retirement. Um, it's their savings bank, right? They're living in their savings bank. Even though my brothers do me just like that, I get a lot of love, so I'm giving it back to them. In January 1865, the Civil War was ending. Union General William Sherman and Secretary of War Edwin Stanton gathered a group of 20 black leaders and asked them what the black community needed to build lives in freedom. Reverend Garrison Frazier, the leader of the group, answered simply, the way we can best take care of ourselves is to have land. Four days after the meeting, Sherman issued Special Field Order Number 15. It set aside hundreds of thousands of acres of land, saying each family shall have a plot of not more than 40 acres of tillable ground. The day before his second inauguration, Lincoln signed a bill that made the plan official. America was almost a very different country. but it didn't turn out that way. Weeks later, Lincoln was dead. His successor, Andrew Johnson, quickly reversed course. Immediately once we say, okay, equal rights, then you have a white backlash that says, well, what about our rights? <laughs> We're talking about bullying before, but apparently the latest group who feels bullied are white people. 55% of them say they believe there is discrimination against white people in America. But when asked for specific examples, they couldn't quite say what they thought it was. In the late 1800s, there was something called the Dolls Rolls, which was basically a census that made records of people's ethnic backgrounds in order to determine which Native American tribes would get certain land allotments and other benefits. After slavery, many black people were associated with some of these tribes. You nigga lover by bloodline, through marriage, through adoption, and even servitude. And because they were associated with these tribes, many black people were entitled to some of these benefits. The government did not want blacks to get these benefits, so they created a separate freedmen's list specifically for black people. 
They also started to list any full-blooded Native American who had African features as black because they didn't want them getting those benefits either. At the same time, they allowed white citizens to come in and pay money under the table to be listed as part Native American. Uh, 1895 and 1896, when a lot of the whites found out the benefits that, that, these, that these blacks were going to be entitled to, a lot of whites went to the Dawes Commission and said, look, uh, why don't you put my name on there? They said, but you're not an Indian. So that's what they said, well, I'll give you five dollars. So the, the, the rule they got around, the policy got around that, that for five dollars, that a white could put his name on the Dawes Rolls and be called himself an Indian and be entitled to all these benefits and all their children could be entitled to all these benefits forever. And so that's, that became known as what's called a five dollar Indian. And so to go around now and check most of the Indians, the so-called Indians in America, about 90% of them are not even Indians. Those are just whites now who are passing as Indians. And but they're getting all the benefits. And they're not paying any taxes, getting free college education. They put up a little reservation on the land that they don't live on. They have another home off uh, and get all kind of benefits. White backlash that says, well, what about our rights? By the end of that year, thousands of freed slaves who had received land were evicted. In just a year after slavery, President Johnson complained about discrimination against whites, quote, in favor of the Negro. But slaves had been creating wealth for their owners for 246 years. That wealth, whites got to keep. And there's an amazing thing about wealth that people who have it know well. It grows across generations. Just ask Jay-Z. I bought some artwork for one million. Two years later, that shit worth two million. Two years later, that shit worth eight million. I can't wait to give this shit to my children. One thing it says is that wealth begets wealth. Turn one million into eight, raise your hand if you want to take that deal. It doesn't take a risky, Picasso-sized bet to see wealth grow dramatically. It just takes time. If you live in a stable country and can invest long-term, values generally go up. That's why you need to know about compounding interest. Imagine you took $100 and invested it in 1863. The average annual inflation-adjusted return in the U.S. stock market has been around 7%. The next year, it's worth a bit more. And a bit more, and a bit more. Today, that $100 would be worth more than $3.5 million. The racial logic adopts the principle that an integrated neighborhood is a bad risk, is a financial risk, that an integrated neighborhood is likely to be an unstable neighborhood. I can understand an individual, depending on his environment or his family or whatever, uh, being racist, but for your country to um, sanction it, give him tools to do that, there's something deadly wrong there. This is systematic! Everybody knows this. And if you deny it, you are a part of the problem. Now let's see how this problem is allowed to persist. Let's see. But then you had some field Negroes who lived in huts, had nothing to lose. They wore the worst kind of clothes, they ate the worst food, and they caught hell. They felt the sting of the lash. They hated their master. Oh, yes, they did. If the master got sick, they prayed that the master died. <laughs> if the master's house caught a fire, they prayed for a strong wind to come along. This was the difference between the two. And today, you still have house Negroes and field Negroes. Yeah. I'm a field Negro. This country has never cared about black people. That's right. They don't give two dams about us. And all of us always turn around worrying about what's good for America, what's good later for America, what's good for black people. And I know what they're going to say, not guilty, because no one saw them pull the trigger. I'm tired of that. Don't bow down anymore. Hold your heads up. We want our freedom now. I don't want to have to go to another memorial. I'm tired of children.
any black leader with charisma was a target of the government's COINTELPRO program. Uh, and that's stated in their own objectives of the program. Well, I've just gotten through a couple of weeks ago with a 45 or 46 day battle of Ingram Park, I call it. That's the park there in Birmingham where we stopped Martin Luther King. And I mean, ladies and gentlemen, we had that nigga whip. FBI in the South, rather than stopping Klan violence, would in fact allow it to happen. And this led to the FBI and its COINTELPRO program and its other racially oriented programs actually being implicated in and instigating uh, crimes. There was a explanation for why our housing was bad, our education was poor, uh, our political power was limited, and that explanation was that we were held as colonial subjects within the United States. Police brutality remains as a major issue in the black community, and I'm sure in, in cities across the country. And probably will remain, because if you just examine what the police department is, it is the military arm of the establishment. So what do you expect of it? You expect it to protect the interests of the establishment. You see, the media has played its traditional role, the white-owned, white-controlled media has played its traditional role back then and today. And their traditional role is to maintain the status quo. Status quo meaning white folks on top, black people on the bottom. Deuteronomy 28:44. He shall lend to thee, and thou shalt not lend to him. He shall be the head, and thou shalt be the tail. So you can see that there is a correlation between the type of illegal and subversive COINTELPRO actions that the FBI wanted to mount against the party and the image that was created in the media of the party. It's okay to do these things to a b group of bad guys. The black Hebrew Israelites are described as a black nationalist hate group with militant overtones. This was a brick by brick system only orchestrated by the Most High, and it was in order to give power to the wicked because my people don't listen. Don't listen. Well, let's see the customs that they destroyed to put my people in a permanent heathen state. It's time to wake up. And then let's talk a moment about pork, ham, bacon, pepperoni. These are some of the things that the scripture tells us we should not eat. He had the holy temple in Jerusalem converted into a temple of Zeus, within which he personally spilled the blood of a pig, a deeply sacrilegious ritual to the Judaic faith. Never betray your new life or you'll lose it. Soul Food is a movie about a big, humongous black grandmother, aptly named Big Mom. Big Mama demonstrates her love by feeding herself and her offspring enormous amounts of pig lard. Then, get this, Big Mama's arteries are so clogged, they gotta amputate her arm. It was her leg! Right, okay, whatever, leg. Then, she dies of a heart attack. <laughs> or another stroke, or something. God called her home. And what does the family do after she dies? They get together for a Sunday dinner and eat the same food that just killed Big Mom. The same food! They didn't learn a lesson. Health alert tonight. Those delicious southern dishes that we all love, well, they're killing us. A new study revealing a southern-style diet is the main reason African Americans are more likely to have high blood pressure than whites. That can lead to heart disease, stroke, and heart attack, and eventually death. Notice chapter 5. Verse 20 through 21. Now therefore, my Lord and Governor, if there be any error against this people, if they sin against their God, let us consider that this shall be their ruin, and let us go up, and we shall overcome them. But if there be no iniquity in their nation, let my Lord now pass by, lest their Lord defend them, and their God before them, 
and we become a reproach before all the world. And simple. If we sin, they win. God does not hear the prayers of a sinner. That's a fact. Fear is not one of the fruits of the Spirit. What they have done is punched and then hide their hands. Well, it's time to see their hands. Brick by brick. Let's see them. My name is Edward Ball, and I wrote the book Life of a Klansman, a Family History in White Supremacy. Constant LeCorn was Edward Ball's great-great-grandfather. He was a Creole French carpenter who lived during the middle of the 1800s. He fought in the Civil War, and afterwards he came home to New Orleans and joined some of the Ku Klux Klan militias that were operating in the South. The fact is, to have a Klansman in your family tree is not a rare thing. My estimate is that about one half of all white Americans can claim an ancestor who participated in the Ku Klux Klan at one point or another. That is to say, about 140 million white people in this country have had a Klansman in the family. And that is part of the story of America. I am Lucifer. Okay, define Lucifer for me. Pure, virtuous, wholesome, innocent individual that's out to help people. Lucifer is? Yeah. Luc say that again. Lucifer is a pure, holy... Virtuous. Virtuous. Now, is he the Lucifer that God created? That's the same one. Oh, man, this is great. I'm going to put this on the Internet. Oh, Amen. God bless you, Amen. brother. Because that's exactly what the Shriners and Masons teach, is that Lucifer, Lucifer is light. <clears throat> See, this is what a Mason confesses, is that Lucifer is light. The word Jesus came from a Greek word, Jesus. And the Greek word, Jesus, was a Greek deity. And um, the word, as a matter of fact, the, the letter J was never in the original Hebrew language, nor the Greek language. J was never there. The, even today, the Hebrew alphabet has no J. The Greek alphabet has no J. The J was the last letter that was introduced into the English language lay, late in the 1500s. And the J letter came because a Catholic monk by the name of Galilitos was experimenting with the eye and put the hook on the bottom of the eye and made it a J. And that's how the J letter came into the English language. So his name was never Jesus. First Maccabees 3 and 48. It laid open the book of the law, wherein the heathen had sought to paint the likeness of their images. What the Greeks did was they repainted all the images. Everything. They just repainted. Painted, quote unquote, white. Even though they're not really white. I'm not really black. I'm brown. But they repainted the images. The Bible says that. It, Joseph was instructed to take, quote unquote, Jesus, not his real name, as you just learned, to Egypt, to blend in. Uh, this is kind of awkward. Matthew 2 and 13. The angel of the Lord appeareth to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt and be thou there until I bring thee word for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Inconspicuous! Century manuscripts. Sometimes, you know, it's uh, amazing that, you know, 
people in the 15th century were they uh, you know aware of color all the saints even the virgin is painted black you know today even today we don't have you don't find such paintings in churches in not always you know a bright color not black color so uh, it has to be studied very, very well you know this type of documents look even the evangelist this is Matthew you know and the harag or the decorations all this you know and as I told you at the beginning piece of clothes to cover it is cotton cotton made huh? this is you know homemade clothes so they protect it somebody come look at this look at this somebody come and look at this look at this Come and look at this. What these youngsters don't know. Look at this. You know, when they talk about just like when they talk about Jews, mm. people, you gotta realize the first Jews were black. I, it took me about a year for my eyes to be opened because I, even though I wasn't a Jehovah's Witness anymore, I still felt like that was the truth. And I was still defending it. And it wasn't until I pushed that out of my mind that my eyes truly got opened. The first thing I want to talk about is in Exodus chapter 4 verses 6 and 7 when God was speaking to Moses and he was going to use him to bring the children of Israel out of Egypt where they were enslaved he was giving him some signs to let him know that hey I will be with you you know I will help you with this so he had told Moses in this particular chapter and verses he said uh, stick your hand into your bosom and when he pulled it out, it says that it was white as snow. Now, if you were to take somebody of my skin color and s stick my hand in my bosom, pull it out, and it's still white, that's not really going to be anything miraculous. But now, if you were to take a person of black skin and put their hand in their bosom, pull it out, and it's white, that would be pretty miraculous. Jesus Christ! What happened to you? Wake up, you were saying. Go, go back for you, go. Go for Jesus. No, forget Jesus, people. It's a very positive thing. I'm not trying to rain on that parade. Quite frankly, I don't feel like it was as controversial as some may, may think, but I just wanted to get your take on what happened. No, it wasn't controversial at all, but the reality is this. You just won the biggest fight of your career, you know? Um, America doesn't want to hear your thoughts on Jesus and you know, keep that stuff at home. Religion, politics, all that stuff. GOP! Good evening, everyone. My name is Dana White. I am the president of the Ultimate Fighting Championship. Keep that stuff at home. Religion, Thank politics, Thank you. I'm sure most stuff. of you are wondering, what are you doing here? I am not a politician. I am a fight promoter. But I was blown away and honored to be invited here tonight and I wanted to show up and tell you about my friend, Donald Trump. Up yours, nigger. When you're in a position of power, i.e. a colonizer, you can be a hypocrite. Is it right? No. But when the wicked rule, the whole world mourns. But when the righteous bears rule, the whole world rejoices. These people have been hypocrites from the start. You can't expect them to change now. Come on. That's folly. But what we have to do now is realize what position and what time we are in today. Let's get a Bible verse just to show you. And then we're going to break that down to let you know how we got in this situation today. Acts chapter seven, verse six. And God spake on this wise, that his seed should should join in a strange land, and that they should bring them into bondage and entreat them evil.
400 years. 400 years. This is why things are going on a zenith path. 400 years have passed. Our freedom is among us. Oh, it's time to wake up. We're gonna break this down brick by brick. Let's get it. Domination, the language of the papal bulls. The theme of domination is found in various Vatican documents from the 15th century. For example, in the Papal Bull of May 4th of 1493, Pope Alexander VI says that it is pleasing to the divine majesty that barbarous nations be subjugated. The Latin word is depramentur, which means to reduce, to cast down or press down, to hold down, and it also states that it is pleasing to the divine majesty for the Christian empire to be propagated. Pope Alexander VI stated, we trust in him from whom empires and dominations and all good things proceed. The Holy See of the Catholic Church issued many such documents even before 1493. For example, in 1452, Pope Nicholas V issued a directive to King Alfonso of Portugal to go to the western coast of Africa and to invade, capture, vanquish, and subdue all Saracens, pagans, and other enemies of Christ to reduce their persons to perpetual slavery and to take away all their possessions and property. That directive was reissued in 1455, 1456, 1481, 1493, 1506, and 1514. So why was the document called a bull? It had to do with the fact that the document was sealed with wax, and that wax was imprinted with the papal ring and the insignia of the Holy See. From that wax was hung a red silken thread, and at the end of the red thread was a lead ball, and the Latin word for ball is bulla. What these documents demonstrate, though, in terms of the language that was used, is the pattern or the paradigm of domination and dehumanization. And this is very clear by looking closely at the kind of language that was used in those documents. They go back to a root word, domo, in Latin, which is a very unusual and obscure word. And it has seven main meanings. To subjugate, to subdue, to force into subservience, to tame, to domesticate, to cultivate, and to till. To cultivate in Latin is colere, which means to colonize or design. When you take the root of colonize, you have colon, which is the digestive tract of the body politic that is coming in invasively into the lands and territories of indigenous nations and peoples. And that colonizing, digesting activity makes that predator body politic a devouring, consuming body that's coming in uh, invasively on top of the original nations and peoples. Because democracy basically means government by the people, of the people, for the people. But the people are retarded. White captains came offering manufactured goods, weapons, and rum for slaves. African kings and merchants had little reason to hesitate. They viewed the people they sold not as fellow Africans, but criminals, debtors, or prisoners of war from rival tribes. This is a dead cell. No food, no water until you die. There wasn't any light. The cruelty of the slave trade didn't begin when displaced Africans stepped onto plantations, nor when they began their journey across the Middle Passage. It started here. About 150 women were here. And they said at that time there were no toilet facilities for them. And this is the original floor. 
On the coast of southern Ghana sits one of the oldest slave castles in the world. I wish at this point to particularly to apologize deeply on behalf of the chiefs and people of Gold Coast and Ghana for the atrocities, the cruelty, the inhuman treatment that were committed 400 years ago by my ancestors during the Atlantic slave trade where over 400 years ago, millions of our brothers and sisters were captured, sold and transported under inhumane and cruel circumstances. What do most Africans think of the slave trade today? If you go in the streets and ask people what they think about slave trade, everyone tells you that slave trade was bad. If you ask them why you think this is bad, all they can do is give you the moral reason I believe the reason is because the scripture says that God has given us a conscience which is able to tell us right from wrong. All the reasons that they're going to give you were moral reasons because Africans, we, we, we have got good moral, uh, good morals. So everyone's going to answer from, uh, from this perspective that it was bad. Why was it bad? They'll tell you that selling your brother or selling your people is bad. But who said it's bad? No, it's going to give you a definite answer. So the general perspective is self-trade was bad. Why? because of more reasons, that's all. So what do you think of the slave trade? To me, slave trade is a form of judgment on Africa, a form of judgment on the, the tribes, the families. God has been judging different nations, different people all the time, and I think that was our turn. Because if, for example, if you read the Bible, you see that every time the children of Israel sinned against God or went astray, God would judge them, even sending them into slavery. The Bible is Black that. History explores DNA evidence and the work of historians and scientists to prove that black people were part of the Israelite community in the Bible. The book claims the world's first man, identified as Adam, was a black man from Africa. My next guest is the book's author. Dr. Theron Williams is a pastor in Indianapolis and a Detroit native. Welcome to American Black Journal. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, so this is fascinating research. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, this is something that I've heard people say mm -hmm. for a long time, right? Sure. Uh, that, that black people were, are part of uh, the original human uh, tribes, mm -hmm. uh, including in the Bible. But, but the idea of trying to prove that through uh, DNA and records, I think, gives it an added dimension. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah the, the, the book advances the notion that the people who made up the Israelite communities, both in Old and New Testament, were people of color, namely black people. They literally did not read the Bible literally. And if you are too afraid to, you are a part of the problem. Repeat! What the Christian slaveholders, and I say Christian slaveholders with quotation marks around it, I think we all have to keep that in mind. What the Christian slaveholders did with their Bibles was to take Paul's descriptions of the New Testament world, slaves obey your masters, which was descriptive of the state of life, and to take that as prescriptive. Therefore, masters may have slaves, and slaves must obey in all situations. So this was a type of literal interpretation, and they could claim that they were being faithful to Scripture, that they were interpreting Scripture literally. Now, of course, to do that, they had to ignore all of the minor prophets and everything that was said in the Old Testament about social justice. And so, of course, it was a very selective literalism, which we still see in Christianity today at times. So it was a principle of interpretation which was good but the principle was distorted in order to support slavery. And those people who are not able to see their own desire for power, their own desire for domination, take these powerful principles and twist them in order to keep that power. And this is what we see in the slaveholders. They could not recognize that their interpretation of scripture was tied to their own wealth, their own prosperity, their own desire to maintain power. They were so blinded by it. Adam? Oh, not just heaven, Ruckus. White heaven. You see, there are many different types of people, Ruckus. So God created many separate, but, well, for the most part, equal heavens. 
You don't say. Strong delusion is the third woes pollution. The Willie Lynch theory is literally synonymous with Deuteronomy chapter 28. It's how you keep an Israelite in perpetual state of being cursed. The black slave, after he receives this, he don't need you to uh, to help him no more. Once he once he's got this in his bloodstream, Absolutely. he'll refuel his own battery. His battery will re recharge itself. He doesn't need you no more. He's gonna hate each other. He's gonna distrust each other. He's gonna be mad with his black brother. He's gonna be mad with his black sister. No matter where he lives, east, west, north, or south. Please continue. Don't forget, you must pitch the old black male versus the young black male and the young black male against the old black male. You must use the dark-skinned slaves versus the light-skinned slaves <laughs> and the light-skinned slaves versus the dark-skinned slaves. You must use the female versus the male and the male versus the female. Mm, mm, mm. You must also have your white servants and overseers distrust all blacks. But it is necessary that your slaves trust and depend on us. They must love, respect, and trust only <laughs> us. <laughs> Gentlemen, these kids are your keys to control. Use them. Have your wives and children use them. Never miss an opportunity. If used intensely for one year, the slaves themselves will remain perpetually distrustful. Hey. Thank you, gentlemen. Hey. Willie Lynch is something else. You see what he's saying here? Pitch the old black man against the young black man. Mm -hmm. Old black woman against the young black woman. The little short niggas against the tall ones. You know what I mean? The women versus the men. The light-skinned slaves versus the dark-skinned slaves. This is what you got to do. You got to make them all hate each other. And this is the formula. You gotta make them all hate each other. And you must use the female versus the male, and the male versus the female. Hey, we locked into a band. Is it any wonder? We're, 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 we we're, we're, we're locked into a band. Hey. Yeah, we're locked into a band. There ain't nowhere to go. When he puts this on us, it's all over. It's all over. Let's just see how in slavery they molded our young. I started to see common behaviors that I took for granted as, well, cultural. There's adaptive behaviors, survival behaviors. Well, what are they? Let's just say 2019, you have a black mother and a white mother. The sons go to school together. They find themselves at a meeting. The black mother leans over to the white mother and says, I just wanted to mention to you that I noticed that your son is really doing quite well. And the white mother's response is, oh, thank you. She begins to go on and on about, he won the science fair, his uncle's an astronaut. She's just oozing. She realizes the black mother's son is actually excelling her son. And she says, well, wait a minute. Your son's the one that's really coming along. And the black mother responds, oh my God, he's a handful, but oh, he just works my nerves. Now, when I'm working with African-American people, it doesn't matter what the audience is. It doesn't matter what class. If I were to ask, is she very proud while she's saying those denigrating things? And everybody laughs and goes, of course, there's a secret. Because everybody black knows that even though the black mother is going, oh my God, she's really proud. His battery will re recharge itself. So now let's roll that scene back 300 years. And let's say this black mother is working in the fields and a white slave owner comes through and says, wow, that boy is really coming along. What is she going to say? No, he's not. He's, he's stupid. He's, he's shiftless. He can't work because I don't want you to sell him. So I denigrate them to protect them. That is called appropriate adaptation when living in a hostile environment. The little white boy, say Timmy, you know, he feels really comfortable and happy about what his mom just said about him. And Trey looks at his mom and wonders, why can't you be proud of me? Because he doesn't understand the secret yet. And by the time he learns the secret, he will have already been injured by it. 
post-traumatic slave syndrome. He's gonna be mad with his black brother. He's gonna be mad with his black sister, no matter where he lives. Quale bambola è bianca? Quale bambola è nera? Quale delle due è bella? Mm, questa. Qual è quella bella? Qual è quella brutta? E qual è quella buona? Quale è cattiva? Qual è buona? Lei. Perché è buona? Perché hai gli occhi celesti? Quale è cattiva? Perché è cattiva? Perché è tutto, tutto nero. E qual è la bambola che ti somiglia di più? post-traumatic slave syndrome. The system is clear now. You have a people calling themselves a color in the crayon box that's not even the color of their skin. It's time to wake up. It's our fault. We transgressed the laws of the Most High God of Israel. We did that. It's not their fault. It's not their fault. I want to make sure I'm clear about this. The first step of healing is to admit fault. Okay? And before I knew, and I was in this world, I was no better than you. No better. This has all been prophesied. Let's go over the parable of the wheat and tares so you understand that all this is biblical. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus told the parable of a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, an enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat. The tare is said to be a type of weed known as the darnel. The darnel is sometimes called false wheat because as it grows, it appears almost exactly like the real wheat surrounding it. But as it nears the harvest, the wheat turns golden brown, but the darnel turns black and its seeds are full of poison. Jesus said, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. One of the distinguishing features of American racial politics is that uh, if you, in, in, in many respects, uh, if you are of apparent African ancestry at all, you're black. Doesn't mean, I mean, you know, Plessy versus Ferguson. Uh, the plaintiff in that case was a, was, a, was a, quote, black person who was seven-eighths white. Didn't matter. That eighth of blackness made you black. Oh. Uh, I was um, 
I was certainly su surprised when I started to discover in the papers of um, Rice Ballard, who starts off as one of the, the country's great slave traders and eventually becomes one of the country's great plantation owners by the 1850s. Uh, the operations he owns are, are producing 10,000 bales of cotton a year. I was surprised to find, to discover uh, the great degree of frankness with which he and his business partners wrote about enslaved women uh, and, and particularly the, the light-skinned ones who were um, sold as, as a, a kind of um, symbol of, of uh, sexual prowess, if you will, uh, marketed as such in, in, in certain ways. I was su su surprised by the degree of frankness to which they, they talked about all of that, talked about their own um, escapades uh, uh, and assaults, uh, sexual assaults on women, uh, and just the way in which they accepted this as, as part of the um, the attraction, the, the, the frills uh, of the trade, uh, the ways in which commodities um, who were human beings were marketed as sexual commodities. Uh, and and this, this was certainly um, one of the, um, the most uh, depressing parts of the research, uh, as, as you can imagine. In September 1802, a Richmond, Virginia newspaper outed Jefferson, saying, by this wench, Sally, our president has had several children. DNA proof of a connection came in 1998. Most human beings I know are quite capable of denial and hypocrisy. People like to say Jefferson built his house. No, <laughs> enslaved like people built his house. Gail Jessup White is a descendant of Hemings and Jefferson and is on the staff at Monticello. I get really emotional when I think about the work we do. I would argue that the people enslaved here are just important to the American narrative as Thomas Jefferson. It started out when I was a kid, me standing up in class and saying, Thomas Jefferson is my great, 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 great grandfather, and being so happy and proud to brag about it on, you know, when we're studying the presidents. But then when the teacher says, sit down and stop telling lies, and all the kids laugh at you. Now, colorism is a very interesting thing. So, for example, Blake Griffith has a son. Blake Griffith's father is a Haitian, a quote-unquote black man. His son is looks like a complete Caucasian, but that son, in fact, is a black man. Guys like Bob Marley, his father is a white man, so he is a white man. This has always been a battle of the seed, the seed, the seed, the, the seed. Now, if you look at it, colorism was created by our enemies. Okay? Colorism was created by our enemies. Revelation 2-9. I know thy works in tribulation and poverty. But thou art rich. Rich in spirit, baby. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. And uh, Rabbi Yosef Shuchat of Chabad East Las Vegas. I'm getting better and better, and you notice that I've been getting better and better at yeah, saying these yeah. names. <laughs> Who knew? Last time he told you that, you might have been Jewish. I, right. And he was right, right on the nose. Oh, my goodness. So, so Rabbi, all right, here's the deal. My, my, my DNA test showing that I have, have uh, Jewish genealogy. What advice do you think the rabbi has for me? Well, so, so you know, the thing is that uh, there's a part of being Jewish and there's a part of being Jewish. And so uh, your part of being Jewish is uh, a smaller part than others, and but it still is 10 fantastic. percent better than no percent. I agree 100 <laughs> percent. And so we're happy to embrace you. This is great. I'm glad <laughs> I'm in the club. Now, uh, Rabbi, what, what, I, I find out that I'm temperate. This is news to me. Is that good news? Are you happy to be uh, Yeah, no, I was excited. I've been thrilled. This is great. Uh, Ashkenazi Jewish genealogy is what it says. I'm 9.9%. What exactly does that mean? Genesis 10. Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So if you believe in the Bible, we all come from three people. And then to them were sons born after the flood. The sons of Japheth, Gomer and Magog and Madai and Javan and Tabal and Meshach and Tadas. And the sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, like Ashkenazi. Hey, wait a minute, I thought the Ashkenazi were shamanic. 
Okay, so Judaism is a little bit different than any other religion. Yeah. Judaism goes by the mother. If your mother was Jewish, then you're automatically Jewish. It doesn't go by the father. It goes only by the mother. Interesting. So if, yeah, so only if your mother is 100% Jewish, if her mother was Jewish, then automatically goes mother, mother, mother. So if your mother was Jewish, her mother was Jewish, so then you're 100% Jewish. There's no 10% Jewish. So it's either 100% Jewish or right. either not. <laughs> but the thing said 10. I Now so, I'm totally confused. So that's a good thing. You could enjoy the holidays. You could do certain things. But the 10% Jewish is great to have you on the show with 10% Jewish. Okay. Right. But in order to be Jewish, you need your mother to You need be to go up. all in on Jewish. Uh -huh, yeah. Okay. Jewish is all the way in. So explain what the, 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 the history behind Ashkenazi Jewish. So Jews are all the same, you know. We all came from Abraham, yeah. Isaac, Jacob, our forefathers. Mm -hmm. Goes by the mother. If your mother was Jewish, then you're automatically Jewish. It doesn't go by the father. It goes only by the mother. Interesting. So it goes by the mother. If your mother was Jewish, then you're automatically Jewish. It doesn't go by the father. It... We all came from Abraham, yeah. Isaac, Jacob, our forefathers. Gotti! Mm -hmm. <laughs> Gotti! <laughs> But then after, of course, Jews spread out throughout all different countries. So today they call them Ashkenazi Jews and Sephardic Jews. It's all the same being Jewish, you know? But Ashkenazi Jews are more the Jews that came from Europe, yeah. Russia, those countries. Okay. And the Sephardic Jews are more that came from Asia or from North Africa, like gotcha. Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, and then like Iran, those countries. Now, let's talk about how the reality of the situation is that C does not come through the mother. It goes through the father. Now, why would they say that it goes through the mother? What did their fathers do to our mothers? I explained it earlier. What does a lion do when he conquers another pride? He enslaves, kills all that are males. That's a fact. It's you, who is just coming out with a book this coming spring, 2020. That's right. Um, on uh, Jews of 18th century Jamaica, um, published by Yale University Press. So very exciting. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about why you chose to write this? Well, I started my graduate work um, writing about travel literature and the Sephardic experience. Yeah. People like Yotzef uh, Chaim David Azulai. And when I was doing my PhD at the Graduate Center for City University of New York, my advisor, Jane Gerber, who is a uh, expert in the uh, in the Sephardic experience writ large, suggested I go to Jamaica and look at uh, archives there. And so I said yes. In fact, it's kind of puzzling why Jews weren't more involved in the slave trade since it was a totally open, uh, open type of endeavor that had no guilds or protections mm -hmm. like that. Um, and Jews owned slaves to the same extent that everybody else did. So of course they would say that the seed goes through the woman when, in fact, God says contrary. Let's get it! Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. For those with eyes to see and ears to hear. The truth will set us free. Stop being afraid, Israel. And if you are a Gentile, it's time for you to stand up for the children of Israel. All praises to the Most High. If you would like to hear another breakdown, comment down below. And don't forget to like and share and comment and all that. Yo, yo, thank you for all your support. If you guys want a fresh hair gear like I got on, my wife made them. She did an excellent job. Go to bigpretty.world. www.bigpretty.world. See ya. 
All right, bye. All praises to the most high.